Good evening and welcome to Southern Hills this evening. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors, as well as those of you joining us via live stream. Um, I hope everyone's had a chance to pick up one of our announcement pages on the way in. If not, there's still plenty of copies left back in the back foyer. Um, but just a few announcements we'd like to make before we begin. We do want to remember Sharon Welburn as she's currently undergoing chemo treatments. Also, Bobby Wilhoyt is at the Blakeford at Green Hills, room 111, uh, for rehab after breaking her shoulder in a fall. Um, so I know she likes she would like to receive letters of encouragement um, as, as she's trying to recover. Uh, we also rejoice with Janie Reams as she has put Christ on in baptism last night. Uh, she was baptized down in Florida by her father, John. So congratulations to Janie Reams and the Reams family. Uh, we have a lot of things going on here at Southern Hills. Um, our summer series continues tonight with Cody Michael from the Decatur Church of Christ. Uh, Cody Michael is also Cassie's brother, so Cassie Welsh's brother, so just to, to make the connection there. And his topic is going to be how we can serve through disasters. And just as a reminder, all of our sixth grade and up will remain here in the auditorium uh, for class. This week's summer youth series, or SYS, will be here at the building. Uh, plan to drop everyone off at 5.30. Uh, dinner will be provided, and then pickup is around 8.15. Uh, Vacation Bible School starts on Sunday evening, so we'll be having some VBS work days. The first one will be Friday, July the 1st, starting at 4 p.m. Uh, dinner is provided. Another one will be Saturday, July the 2nd, starting at 10 a.m. And for that one, lunch will be provided. If you have any questions, see Cody or Nikki Lovett or Rachel Potts. Um, also, just, just uh, as a piggyback to that, our kickoff for Vacation Bible School will be Sunday, July the 3rd, after our evening services. Um, again, dinner's provided. We're asking everyone, please bring drink, desserts, and your favorite homemade ice cream. And also, around dark, we'll be having our 4th of July fireworks show. Um, as, as we've done in the past, this is all privately funded, the fireworks are, so if you would like to make a donation towards the fireworks, if you would see David Broom. Uh, next Friday will be our Breakfast with Dan, that will be July the 8th, um, and then also Sunshine School is still looking for some teachers to, fill, to round out their teachers for our next school year. Um, and then also in the uh, announcement pages is the new address for Bobby and Wanda Ezel. Um, and I know they would like to hear from us as they're getting settled in down there in uh, Alabama. Uh, but those are the announcements that I have for tonight. If you would, bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we are thankful for your word. We are thankful for the times that we get to spend here in worship. Father, we pray that as we enter your throne in worship, that you be with each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. So good to see each and every one of you here this evening. Let's start out our service with number 501, number 501, I'll worship the king. Oh,
Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we come before you this evening, grateful for another opportunity to gather as a Christian family. We thank you for this time that we're able to take out of our week to focus our minds and our hearts on you. We pray that we take this message that we're about to receive from your word, that we're able to apply it into our lives, that we don't just hear it, that we're able to act it out, that we're able to enact it within our lives. We thank you for your word that you've given us that we can study, that we can know how to live our lives, how we become, can become that living sacrifice and reject the world. We thank you most of all for the gift of your son, and it's through his name that we pray, amen. Your Bibles to Matthew in chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. I was asked a question a few weeks ago that, you know, no, no Christian really wants to answer. They said, what's your favorite verse in the Bible? And it's like, man, if I start picking and choosing, that's not exactly how we need to start this Bible study. But I had a few that came in my mind. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse number 3, was probably one of the most unlikely ones that, that could have been put. But, but I think it's one of my favorite verses for a number of reasons. Verse number three says, Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. Such a simple statement, very simply put, very plainly put. A sower. We get to find out what the man is who Jesus is talking about. He is a sower. Well, what does that mean that he's supposed to be doing? A sower went out. When he goes, what is he going to do? He's going to sow. And then I think about the Great Commission. In Mark chapter, 15, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, verse 16, we find out that he's giving the great commission to the disciples. And I think about the fact that we are all disciples. If we're followers of Christ, if we've been baptized into his son's blood, if we've been forgiven of our sins, we have a responsibility. And when we're baptized into Christ, we take on the name of Jesus. You can't get the word Christian without Christ being involved. It doesn't happen. So when we say a Christian goes out, what should we be doing? Now, we can't say, well, Christian stuff. We get a sower. He's doing his responsibility. What does the disciple do? He goes to make other disciples. When we read the Great Commission and we hear straight from Jesus that he's telling those who he's leaving in the world as he gets ready to ascend and go back to be with the Father, he tells them he wants them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, that does a couple things to us. One, it gives us an instruction. What are we supposed to be doing when we go? How are we supposed to be spending our time? What are we supposed to be involved in? Well, he says, first off, to go and to preach. So not only does he say to go, but he says to do something as you are going, to be speaking about. Preach the gospel. Well, then we've got to ask ourselves, what is the gospel? And, and I've asked that question recently. I started mowing a, a cemetery right down the road from our house. And just through mowing this cemetery, we've ended up in 14 different Bible studies. People that are coming to visit the cemetery because they had a loved one there. People that are showing up because they've got an upcoming funeral. Or some people just stop to ask what in the world I'm doing up there because nobody else takes care of it. And through these 14 Bible studies, I like to start with that first question. What is the gospel? Well, you get the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Oh, that's what it is. It's those, it's those four books of the Bible. Well, no, that's not the gospel. And then you get the question of, let's ask again, what is the gospel? Well, it's the good news. Well, what is the good news? And so many people in this world don't have a clue what the gospel is. But we take the time as we go to preach the gospel. So we as Christians, we as brothers and sisters in Christ, we've got to be going, we've got to be preaching, and we've got to know what it is that we're going to be talking about. So when he sends the disciples out and he sends them to speak about the gospel, he wants them to go to baptize. Well, obviously that gospel has to be tied to baptism. Through the representation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we begin Bible studies about what the gospel really is all about. What is that great mystery that so many times is referenced to? What is the gospel whenever it's told that, that Paul would be going to spread the gospel, the sermons that would share the gospel, the disciples that were instructed to teach the gospel? And what did it lead to? It led to the church growing. So when we ask ourselves tonight, do we want to see the kingdom grow? We know what we've got to do. We know what our responsibilities are. And maybe we've struggled with that. Maybe we need some encouragement. Maybe we need brothers and sisters who will push us. God never intended a single person to have to fight alone. When it comes to spiritual battles, he never intended any of us to be alone. He intended us to be together because iron sharpens iron and we strengthen one another so that we can be victorious in all of the things that we have to face. So tonight, if you need a church family that loves you, 
that says we want to fight together, whatever your struggle may be. Or maybe tonight you need to obey the gospel for the first time to be able to put on Christ in baptism. Whatever your need may be, if there's anything this congregation can do to serve you, we ask you to come as we stand and as we sing. come out here to worship with us this evening here at Southern Hills. Thank you, Brother Cody, for that lesson. Um, we do have classes prepared for all ages, and again, the sixth grade and up are to remain in the auditorium. Um, but if you're visiting with us, we want you to know that you are our honored guest, and if you see a member, please be sure to ask them what class to go to and ask any information here about Southern Hills. Hope you can all come back for our Sunday morning service at 9 a.m. Before our closing prayer, let's sing number 234, Higher Ground. I'm going to sing on. as we go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we come before your throne today thanking you for this opportunity to come together and learn more about your word. We thank you for the, the ability that our country provides us to come here freely without persecution and that we can learn from your word and, and take it to everybody around us with, without that fear of persecution. Lord, we, we uh, thank you for that. Lord, we ask you to please be with us as we go to our classes. Help us to clear our minds of those worldly distractions so that we can focus truly on the, the lessons being provided. 
Lord, please be with those who are sick and not able to attend tonight. Please help them to get better and uh, so that they can be with us again. Please forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He said we could either have 30 minutes or all night, so I chose all night. So uh, if you need to get a pillow, go ahead and do so. You've got a couple minutes to grab a blanket, anything you need to fall asleep with. You'll open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. That's where we're going to begin today. Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to ask a question. He said sometimes people talk, sometimes they don't, so we're going to see what happens. Who in here has ever been on a disaster relief trip? I've got two. All right. Can, if either one of you mind sharing, what's, what's your most vivid memory of being on a disaster relief trip? No doubt, no doubt. That's definitely a big one. When, when, did I have somebody else? I thought I saw another hand go up for a second. I was about to get excited. That would be two people. <laughs> As you think about disasters and how do you serve somebody in a disaster, it comes down to a lot of different angles because everybody's disasters are different. You never experience the same thing twice when it comes to devastation. There's emotional losses, there are physical losses, there are spiritual losses. There are all sorts of different things that tie in to what it means to go through a disaster. And I'll share with you a little bit of what we do uh, from not just the cater, but we've grown and what's called Project Unify. Project Unify is a disaster relief group that started in North Alabama 
uh, we decided when we were at Grant Street Church of Christ, we wanted to serve some people uh, through disasters as well as through servanthood. Because honestly, Jesus was a servant. He was the biggest servant out of all of us. He came not only to serve through washing feet, but he taught people. He spent time with people. He healed people. He took care of those who were sick. He wasn't concerned with what condition their life was in at the moment. He was concerned with what condition they wanted their lives to get to. So he would serve them. And let's be as clear as we can about this. If we're going to get to heaven, we can't do it without following Jesus' example. If we're going to get to heaven, we have to be a servant. If you don't serve people, you will not be in heaven. Because Jesus was the biggest servant of all of us. He was an example to every single person alive to be a servant, to give to other people, to share your time with them, to do things for them, to go out of your way sometimes for other people, which means sometimes we've got to make sacrifices. So when we talk about serving, we wanted to serve people, and the elders at the congregation I was at said, how, do we gonna, how are we going to do this? I said, well, let's look at buying a truck and buying a trailer. And they said, well, why do you want to do that? And I said, because I'm not good at very many things. But physical labor is something that anybody can do, so I know I can do that. So we got a truck and we got a trailer, and we decided from that point forward, we were either going to serve locally or we were going to haul food to different places. So about a week after we bought a 2002 F-250 and a 16-foot enclosed trailer, about a week later, Hurricane Florence is sitting on the coast of America right off the North Carolina shore. Hurricane Florence moved on, and if you remember much about it, in 2018, it just stopped moving, and it dumped rain and rain and rain and rain and rain. So we started telling everybody locally, if you'll help us fill this trailer up, we're going to take it to people in need. And so they filled it up with snacks. They filled, we had three totes of Oreo cookies. That was probably the most tempting thing I've ever experienced, of not eating the Oreos on the trip, because they're supposed to be there for somebody else. And I say that to say when we get to where we're going, you would think something as simple as Oreos might be a temptation to the people in the vehicle. But when we got there, it was about 1230 at night. We were in Jacksonville, North Carolina. And when we rolled in, they had been spending their whole day trying to get 18-wheelers unloaded from Nashville with the disaster relief crew out of Nashville. And so we came in, we finished helping them unload those trucks, and then we opened the tailgate of ours, and everybody's face kind of dropped. It was floor to ceiling, as full as we could get it. And one of the ladies said, we've been going all day. And I said, well, we'll take care of this. Let us do it. The first thing we opened was the Oreos. And this woman that was so exhausted, her eyes just lit up. And she got extremely excited. And she said, you don't understand, you've got Oreos. And I was like, it's just Oreos. It's not that big of a deal. She said, and I don't know how diabetes works, but everywhere that was in that area, the power had been out for days. And she had run out of her insulin. And she had to have something with sugar. And every store was closed. And everybody had already used up most of what they had. And Oreos was going to give her the energy and the stamina to continue forward so she felt healthy enough to do it. And she got so excited about Oreos. When we got done unloading the trailer, we came back home, we took another load. Then we came back again. And I kept noticing there's other people around us that are working. Well, Hurricane Michael, a couple of weeks later, hits down in Panama Beach, Florida, Panama City Beach. So we go down there to help out. We did the same thing. We dropped off some stuff and we left. We dropped off some stuff and we left. And it started to kind of click. The more often that you just go and drop something off, if you don't use the voice that God gave you, then what, what good is it? Benevolence without evangelism for a Christian is done in vain. Now let me repeat that because we need to know this. Benevolence without evangelism for a Christian is done in vain. What I'm saying is that God blessed you with something to give to someone else. And if we're not evangelistic with it, then we might as well take the name of the church off and just be a benevolent group. But if everything that we've been blessed with by God is intended to bless someone else, then we've got to give God the glory. The opportunity to teach and spread the gospel pops up in a thousand different ways every single day if we just open our eyes to see the opportunities. So we decided after that, Mount Juliet, when they got hit by tornadoes, we, we met some different people there, and we decided two things. All right, we are done doing benevolence just to do benevolence. Because when you only do benevolence, you end up patting yourself on the back because you did a good job, you feel great about what you did, and you come home to try to go after the next pat on the back. But when you go at something and says, let's make this about two things. Let's make it about the kingdom, and let's make it about saving souls. Okay, so the kingdom means it's bigger than any one place, because that includes all of us. So we decided what we're going to do is we're going to be a central hub. We'll be the location that has the truck and the trailer. Let's reach out to other congregations and see what strengths and talents they have. So Decatur Church of Christ is now where Project Unify is based out of. Uh, Priceville Church of Christ jumps in first, and they said, look, we're not big. We've got about 30 members. 
But here's what we want to do. We want to make sure there is always a Bible and some literature on that truck to make sure that anybody you come in contact with gets a Bible and they get literature about the church. That way if they have questions of why the Church of Christ, now they've got some answers. So that's how they joined into Project Unify. They took what strength they had and they applied it. Priceful Church of Christ started it. Then Flint, which Chris Preston will be here soon for y'all's vacation Bible school. Flint was the next one to jump in. They said, we'll take care of all your cleaning supplies. Never again will you have to load cleaning supplies. We will take care of that. Well, then Hartsell Church of Christ, right down the road from them, jumps in. They're taking care of roofing materials. And one right after the other, North Alabama is starting to get a lot of congregations. And let me tell you this, most of the congregations involved in it now, about three years ago, wouldn't speak to one another. They had just some time back in the 70s and 80s had a rift. They decided we're not going to talk to each other anymore, and they separated. Well, that's, that division is not what God intended for the kingdom. The kingdom was stronger when it was brought together. And so all of these congregations that now we got over our issues from before I was even born, and all of a sudden we're working together again. Does that not bring God glory? That's what God intended for the church, that we would be a kingdom-minded people to support and help one another, no matter if it's 30 members in a congregation or 3,000. That they would bring their talents and bring what they're good at to the forefront and we would work together. It was crazy because not long after that we got ready to go to the next set of storms and we get a phone call from a news crew and they said we want to come and we want to interview what y'all are doing. For the first time I got to talk about Jesus on television and they couldn't edit it out. So when we start talking about why do you do what you do, well, you put a camera where about you know 30,000 people in one city are going to hear it. Give me a chance to talk about Jesus. Would that not be what you would do? Let's talk about Jesus. God started opening up these doors like crazy. Now we've got a group in Oklahoma at the Waterloo Road Church of Christ. We've got a group in Ella J, Georgia. We've got uh, the Highland Heights congregation over in Lebanon. They joined in with us. They're all taking on different portions of Project Unify. We've got groups in southern Middle Tennessee that are joining in. And our goal is to one day every single state would have a team for disaster relief with one purpose, to be evangelistic. If it ever falls away from the purpose of evangelism, then let's take the name of the church off of it and just do benevolence. If it ever gets to a point there's false teaching, let's take the name of the church off of it and let's just do benevolence. But as long as we get to be involved in this, as long as the kingdom is working together, the whole purpose is the evangelism, to set up Bible studies. I want you to see in Matthew chapter, chapter 24 is where we're going to be at. Matthew chapter 24, 25, I'm sorry, starting out in verse number 14. He said, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his, his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents to another two and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. So what he's saying is this, this guy comes to these servants and he starts handing out stuff. He says, I know I can trust you with these. Now the next guy, he doesn't say, I don't think I can trust you. He just lessens the amount and says, I think I can trust you with this. Then he gets to the last guy, and this one talent man, he doesn't say, I don't trust you. He says, I trust you, and I, want, I trust you with this. Take care of my things, and he leaves. He steps away. One thing that we can learn from the very beginning of this lesson is to lean on one another in a way we learn to trust one another. That we can learn to trust one another. What's one of the biggest things that hinders us from coming forward during the invitation? Fear of what somebody might think. We haven't learned to trust one another spiritually. We haven't learned to trust one another with our emotions. When we go on these disaster areas and we find people that are just struggling, so many places we've been, Laurel, Mississippi, when they were hit with a tornado, the hardest thing to do was to get someone to accept help because they barely had anything before the tornado and they didn't want to admit that the tornado hadn't touched their house, but they were in need. They didn't want to say it. Too much pride got in the way. Too much, too much of, I don't want you to know I'm struggling got in the way. Guys, even more important than any physical struggle you've ever had, when you're struggling spiritually, we've got to let one another know. We've got to learn to be there for one another. Jesus comes to all these different people. The woman caught in adultery, how embarrassed do you think she was? There's no way she wanted to have to say what she was doing. The woman at the well, when Jesus gets up there and he says, bring me your husband. And she says, well, sir, I don't have a husband. And he says, yeah, you've been married all these times. And this guy you're just shacking up with. How much embarrassment and shame do you think could have been in that moment? Had she not started to understand who Jesus was? When we start to understand the role of a Christian, we can get over our embarrassment. We can get over our shame. And we can fight together to overcome struggles. 
The same way in a disaster, you try to give resources to someone so that they can overcome whatever struggle they're in. When we were in Louisiana, uh, this is one that, that just blows my mind. It was crazy. And, and it was kind of funny, and I tried not to laugh. I was sitting on the front porch of this RV. This lady's the RV had rolled over on its side. We had set it back up for her, so she was back on all four wheels. And that's where she lived, in this little RV park. And we were sitting on the porch of it, just talking. And she, so I finally asked her, I said, you want to have a Bible study? And she said, I'd love to talk about Jesus. And I said, you know, are you a Christian? Absolutely. And so I asked her that question. Do you know what the gospel is? And there we went chasing rabbits. Well, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, it's, it's the good news. Well, it's something in the Bible. Well, yeah, it's something in the Bible. That's for sure. You know what it is. So we start studying. We studied for maybe two hours. And we got about two hours in, and she looks at me, and she says, that Baptist preacher lied to me. And I got, did everything I could not to laugh. And I wanted to say, no, he didn't lie to you. He was deceived the same way Satan wanted to keep you deceived. And we've got things that we don't want to talk about. When I asked her what's the gospel, she missed the question the first time. So immediately, well, that's not what I meant. She was embarrassed that she didn't know the answer and she didn't know what to do. And so many times we end up in the same shoes. We get embarrassed because we don't have a solution when really we do have a solution. One another. The body of Christ is stronger when we stay together. So through that moment, we were able to teach the gospel. And immediately she said, so where's water at? And I said, well, the church building's about five minutes down the road. We jumped in the vehicle and straight to the building we go. She comes back and starts converting people all throughout her neighborhood. Because that's what Christians do. When we talk about a tree that is going to have fruit on it, he's talking about whether we're making other disciples. An apple tree makes apples. A fig tree makes figs. A Christian who is a disciple makes other disciples. And so through that moment, she got over the embarrassment and the shame side of things because she didn't know an answer. And she said, okay, if I don't know, then show me. Maybe there's people within our own congregations that are struggling with, with emotional and spiritual disasters. How many men do you think on average are struggling with pornography addictions or language addictions or, or some sort of an attitude problem? And yet they don't want to admit it because they don't really know how to overcome it. You can't just turn it off and it go away. You've got to actually face the problem and make a plan to overcome it. The same way in a disaster that's physical, you've got to make a plan to overcome it. But we get so ashamed and afraid to talk about what we're dealing with that our disasters just remain disasters until our entire lives are consumed with, with this fear of anxiety, this struggle, this, this strain that we don't know how to overcome. We feel so overwhelmed like we just can't see the light at the end of a tunnel. We get to a position where we don't even want to ask for help because we don't even know what help looks like anymore. We get so exhausted with thinking through things that we never take the steps of action to overcome what we're dealing with. And meanwhile, God's given us every answer we ever needed. You know what people in a tornado need? Servants. That's what God called us to be. Do you know what people struggling with the addictions need? Servants. That's what God called us to be. Do you know what people that are struggling with lust and adultery and fornication need? People that will serve them with their talents. There are therapists. There are people that will give you counseling. There are people that can help with physical disasters. There are people that can run skid steers and can run excavators. There's people that can write cards of encouragement. There are people that can make phone calls. There are people that can simply play a football game to realize, hey, I'm not the only athletic person in the church. All of a sudden, doors open like crazy because we start declaring our faith rather than hiding from it. We don't hide from disasters. We're servants. Jesus came to this world to give us an opportunity. So as we get down to that, he says he gives them all of these talents. He gives them something, and then he leaves and he goes on his journey. He trusted these men to do something with those talents. The same way he's given you a talent. I don't know what it is. I don't know what your talent specifically is for you. I don't know if you're a five-talent person or a one-talent person. But I can promise you, God has given you a gift and a talent to be able to use for his glory. Are you doing so? So we get a little further in. Verse 16, then he who had received the five talents went and traded them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. These guys are out doubling things like crazy. They started out with just a little and boom, they're making more and more and more. They're going after it. The same way that, imagine how big the church would be if every person who had been forgiven of their sins would go out to teach someone else that they could be forgiven of their sins. Imagine where the kingdom would be today if that was our goal and our focus. And it should be. But watch what happens with this next guy. And get down to verse number 18. But he who had received one went to the other two and asked them how they doubled it. 
No, that's not what he did. It would have been smart, but maybe he was embarrassed because he didn't know how they doubled their talents. Maybe he was ashamed because he felt like, well, I've only got one. I'm not, I'm not as good as somebody else. I don't have the five like you did. I don't have the two like you did. Maybe he's thinking, you guys doubled yours faster than me. Now, I don't even know what to do. You didn't include me. I don't know the plan. What could have happened had this one talent man went to the other two and said, teach me what you did. Teach me. Sh share with me what you did. What could have happened in that moment? The kingdom could have been strengthening the kingdom. But instead, he gets nervous, he gets awkward, he gets afraid, whatever it is, he goes and he buries it because he later tells us that he was afraid. He goes and buries it. He says, I'm just going to hang on to this one. I'm not going to do nothing with it. Not everybody's going to be a song leader. I, for one, am not going to be a song leader. But I've been instructed by God to sing and to praise him the same way as everyone here tonight has been. Do we do that when we praise or do we mumble? Do we even open our mouths? Because when God's given us a talent, a talent may not be the thing that you're the absolute best at, but it's something that you can accomplish. And so when we talk about having an ability, everybody that's got a voice has the responsibility to sing praises to God, not just to sing praises to Him, but to encourage one another. I was telling Sai a minute ago, I'd never heard that song uh, about the anchor. What's it called again? Well, your anchor hole, I'd never heard that. Man, the words to that, the thinking about something that, that is in place and isn't going to move. It'll keep me stationary. It'll make sure that even when everything's chaotic around me, I'm, I'm, I'm solid. I'm not moving. If my anchor is God, then who cares what somebody else thinks about my voice? I'm going to praise him. And it blows my mind that when we get together to sing out and we start praising God, if you just look around the room a little bit and see everybody's faces, the ones that are singing, man, you can't stop the smile. But those that are embarrassed and ashamed of their voice, they don't smile. And when God talked about how it was to encourage one another, the dude knew what he was talking about. God knew what he was saying when he gave us those instructions. So when he gives us the instruction to serve one another, no matter what position we're in, no matter what we're, what we're facing, no matter what situation, serving one another is absolutely crucial. I'm going to share with you another story. And this one was in Mount Juliet. And this one, this is, I might even get emotional telling it to you because it's crazy. So we're, we're in Mount Juliet and we went over, I don't even remember the name of it. It was like Dunbarton School or something like that. There was a neighborhood around this school and it started with a D. That's all I can remember. But we went house to house and we were saying, can we help you? Can we serve you? Can we put tarps on your roof? Can we cut the trees up for you? What, what can we do to serve you? I get to this one house and this lady's got this tree laid across the back of her home. And it's just crushed, like her sunroom and part of her bedroom and some other stuff. And so I came around the front of the house and I said, ma'am, I said, can I, uh, can I come back there and you know, just cut that tree up, get it off your house? We're completely free. We don't charge a penny. We're just here to serve. And she says, are you with that church group parked up on the corner? And I'm thinking, you know, it's the South. That's a great way to start a con. Yes, I'm with that church group parked up on the corner. I'm thinking, you know, getting puffed up a little bit. I shouldn't have because immediately she said, well, I'm an atheist. No thanks. Get off my property. I'm like that took a turn I did not expect. I didn't think it was going to go this way. So I kind of just, you know, tucked my tail and was like, okay, I'll get off your property. So I, I would go down the sidewalk, down the stairs, and I'm in the driveway. And I don't know, you ever had one of those moments where you feel like you just maybe should have tried a little harder, but you didn't try hard enough? So I turned around, and I came back upstairs, I said, ma'am, I said, I know you're atheist. And I said, but I didn't even ask you anything about your soul. I said, can I just pray with you? Her neighbor was standing in the yard with her, and her neighbor kind of elbowed her, like, you know, be nice. And she says, okay, fine, whatever. And her husband went off, and he didn't want to hear the prayer. I have no idea what we said during that prayer. I just figure we were probably praying that her situation would get better, that, you know, this neighborhood would be cleaned up quickly. And about halfway through praying, I can hear her crying. And she's like that gasping for breath kind of crying. And I'm thinking, did I just mess up entirely? I, you know, I've already been told to get off the property, and now she's crying. By the time we get to the last part of the prayer and we said amen, she looks up and she points out across the street and she says, I believe there's a God and I see him for the first time. And she pointed to everybody that was with us across the street, cleaning up other people's yards and putting tarps on roofs. An atheist for the first time believed there was a God because she saw the body of Christ doing something with what they could. There were men out there that the only thing they've ever done was construction. So you know what they were doing? Putting tarps on roofs and making sure it was done right. There were people that had done, you know, didn't know how to do much more than run chainsaws and do farm work. So you know what they were doing? They were running tractors and running chainsaws. And a lady who claimed there was no God 
now believes that there is a God and immediately went into Bible studies with the Mount Juliet Church of Christ following that day to start learning about God. Because the body of Christ took the talents that they had and they did something with them. I mean, if you see that stuff in a movie, it would choke you up. But seeing it happen in real life and realizing that when God sent Jesus and Jesus says he's going to serve, that serving others is the quickest way to open up Bible studies so we can teach the gospel, so we can fulfill the Great Commission. And if we don't fulfill the Great Commission, there will be no heaven for us. It's serious stuff. It's not something to be passive about and think that, well, I'll just casually bring up Jesus every now and then in something. We do this with a purpose because it's who we are. We belong to Christ. We are not our own. We were bought with a price. That means every time we ask, what should I do? We'll ask that question from 1992. What would Jesus do? And then we've got our answer. Watch as we go a little bit further into these talents. Instead of this man asking everyone else, how did you get to where you were? Instead of him finding a role model and trying to follow their example, instead he goes off and he hides it. And he just waits. So he received five talents, came and brought the other five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents, and looked, I've gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of our Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. He said, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Just imagine being the one talent man, listening to these conversations from a distance. What's going through his head? What's he thinking about? He sees the one with five, comes back with ten, and he sees this almost celebration moment. And this master telling him, you know what, you've done fantastic. Maybe that moment is when we get a, I don't know, a football player. And he, he's developed his talents, and he's been in the locker room every day becoming the best he can because he's going to do all that he does in word or deed as if he's doing it for the Lord. And he becomes the best football player that he can possibly be, and he enters the locker room every day with a goal to reach one soul. And he's converted some people on his football team, and when he's walking into his judgment day, God is saying, look, I blessed you with some athleticism. Some ability to get out there and level somebody, but also to help them back up with a gentle spirit. I've given you the ability to outrun somebody, to beat them to the end zone, but also congratulate them because they were good competition. You've done a fantastic job. Enter in that good and faithful servant. Maybe the next guy is, is a factory worker. Maybe, maybe it's a stay-at-home mom who's raising these kids up to be able to know and acknowledge the Lord. And maybe through all of those, those hours that were strugglesome, maybe through all those times that you were just wanting to pull your hair out, maybe through the extra hours at the plant that you were having to put in to make sure that you could, but you did it with the purpose of teaching others about Christ. Maybe in that moment Jesus says, enter in that good and faithful servant. And then on this, this back corner you get this one talent guy. And he's listening to these celebrations. And he's thinking, I, I didn't do anything with what I'd been given. I was given a voice I could have sang. I was given the ability to read. I could have read scripture. I could have been in my Bible daily. Because what did Acts 2 teach us? They studied the scriptures daily. If you're a Christian and your Bible's not open every day, I don't believe God's going to be pleased with how we're living our daily lives. Because when we're given the example to follow and we don't do it, how can we be pleasing to our God? I heard a quote, and uh, if you look on Facebook, look up the, uh, the Unscripted podcast with Robert Tipps and Chris Donovan. And I was listening to it. They were reviewing kind of what we did last week. A couple of the guys here went to Little Mountain Ministry Camp. And they were going over it, and Chris Donovan made a statement, because all the things happening in America right now. He said, I'm afraid that we as families, as husbands and as wives, are more concerned about the, the, the situation that America is and not the situation that the kingdom's in. I want you to think about that. More concerned about the situation America is in and not as concerned about the situation the kingdom is in. And we get so caught up in politics. We're ready to argue about who's in the office, about what law should have been passed, about whether that law was right or wrong, uh, the Roe versus Wade thing being overturned. That's fantastic. But if we're more concerned about the laws and who's in office, then we are making sure that our disciples who are being taught the reason that needed to be overturned who cares if the law changes if we don't know the God that created the people? 
And so in those moments, we, we've got to realize some things, that we can sit in the back corner and not use our talents and not use our abilities. We can stay quiet and we can get really, really scared of our judgment day. Fathers, what do your kids know about God? Are you leading your home? In what way have you nurtured your wife and the admonition of the Lord? In what way have we led people to come to know Christ? Because if we don't do that, heaven will not be our home. I don't know how much more plainly to put that. But when we think about what talent God has given us, if it's football and athleticism, maybe it's running track, maybe it's basketball. Maybe you're really good at running construction equipment. Maybe you're the best homeschool teacher there has ever been. Maybe you're the best public school teacher there could ever be. What ways are you using the talents God has given you? Because watch what happens with this guy. And it's really kind of heartbreaking. Verse number 25 or 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what's yours. Imagine your judgment day, your voice being in desperation. Is that where you want to be? Because the way that you live this life, the way you handle every single day, will determine what your voice will sound like on your judgment day. Is it in desperation? Or is it in confidence like Paul who says, I've run the race, I've, I've finished it. I'm, I'm entering into the kingdom boldly. Watch what happens when this, this master is going to tell him some things. Verse 26, but his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seeds, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. At my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. One of the things that we do uh, through Project Unify and the disaster relief that, that we're involved with, we like to send groups like I said, the cool part is we've grown to the point that we've got more than one state involved. I think right now in total, there's, there's 13 congregations that are part of Project Unify. Uh, and what we do is we say, okay, so if, if a hurricane hits in Louisiana, the first congregation to go is always Decatur. We try to be there by the next morning. We want to be there as quickly as we can because if you're not there quickly, every group and their brother comes in and then all of these Bible studies are being set up by denominations and there's a ton of false teaching and people that are already emotionally broken are being led astray by false teaching and false hope. So we try to get there quickly because this is urgent. God tells us about meeting urgent needs and that that's what we need to be doing. So we try to get there by the next day after a disaster. We'll stay for the first week. And then when we get ready to leave, the next congregation will come to take our place. So Alabama takes the first week, then Oklahoma is going to come in the next group, then Georgia is going to come in the next group. And the reason we do that is for the relief portion. There is no man that is a part of Project Unify that can stay on a trip more than five days unless he is single and retired. One of the two. Because our men spend enough time away from home as it is. And if we go on a disaster relief trip, we need to get home to teach our families why we did what we did. Our kids need to hear the stories of why we're serving other people. Why are we spending that time? Because even more important than the serving out and abroad, you've got to get your family to heaven. You always hear people say, you know, Noah got his kids on the boat. There may have been issues there, but he got his family on the boat. When we, when we talk about going out somewhere... We've got to come home, and we've got to spend time at home because our kids need us, because our wives need us, because we need that family dynamic to be stronger than it's ever been, because the world is attacking our families harder than they've ever attacked them before. And we've got to do something about that. So let's say you go to Louisiana for five days. You come home. What are you going to do? You're going to share that with your family. Tell them what you've done. Open your Bibles and explain to them why you did what you did, because the whole time you're there... If you don't have the mindset of trying to start a Bible study, then just put the chainsaw down and let's talk about it. The only reason the chainsaw gets started is to open a door for the gospel. The only reason the truck drives down the road is to open a door for the gospel. The only reason that we do anything with a skid steer of moving brush off of someone's house and tarping up their roof is so that we can open doors for the gospel. I told you earlier when, when they asked how we wanted to serve other people, I'm not good at a lot of things. If, I, if you had a dry erase board up here, you would see my spelling is horrible. My math is even slower than that. I, I was never good in college, so I never finished college. Uh, there's a lot of things that I'm just simply not good at. But when God's given you a talent and an ability, what will you do with it? I'm pretty good at physical labor. Anybody can do those sort of things. And I'll take you back to our in-town stuff. 
there's not always a disaster. And this year has been kind of interesting. There's not been any long-term tornadoes early on this year. So we haven't done a whole lot of stuff disaster relief related. related. But what Project Unified does very good is we don't just let equipment sit. If God's blessed you with something, he sure doesn't want it to dry rot. Amen? Whether it's your talent, whether it's your physical items, God does not intend what he's given you and blessed you with to sit around and dry rot, including your physical body. He wants you to do what you can with what he's given you. So we take our equipment and our stuff and we go out and we serve the community. The, the Highland Heights Church of Christ, they've got a 2001 F450. That was our second truck we ever purchased. We drove it for a little over a year. When they joined, we gave it to them. And now they're in charge of running that truck. We've got our 2012 uh, F450. And then there is a 2002 Freightliner ambulance. It's a huge ambulance that's in Oklahoma. And they use it for Bible studies because it's air conditioned. So every one of us has something we can serve with in the community. So we started taking care of a cemetery up the road. I called the state, they said they didn't own the land. I called the county, they said they didn't own the land. I called the city, they said they didn't own the land. Finally, I got with a historian who knows about it in North Alabama. No one has ever claimed the land this cemetery sits on. Nobody ever staked it back whenever they first founded the country, when they first got Alabama going. Nobody has ever claimed this land, so it belongs to no one. If you want a burial plot for free, go up to Grange Hall Cemetery. You can put anything you want out there and nobody will stop you. I know that because the homeless people that pass away in Decatur, guess where the, cemetery, or the, the funeral homes put them? They go out to Grange Hall Cemetery, dig a grave, and leave it unmarked. You have no idea where most of the graves are unless someone's done the research. So I just decided there's 16 Civil War graves. There's some that predate the Civil War. There's lots of different ones with all kinds. Of, there's even a rock with a sign next to it. And all it says is, this rock killed Eddie Thixton. Nothing else, just a sign that says this rock killed Eddie Thixton. The story goes, he rode his horse, he had fallen asleep on his way home in the Civil War, he fell off of his horse, busted his head on the rock, and he bled out right there. And that was what it, that, that's all that's left. So I started mowing it and weed eating it. I'm not good at many things, I can do physical labor. So I started mowing and weed eating. And time after time, people that were grieving because they had just lost someone would be sitting next to their grave and I, I'd just come over and say, hey, Tell me about your family member. I'm going to keep their grave as clean as I can for as long as I can. And they'd give me stories about their mom or their dad who had passed away, about a grandparent, uh, one family that had lost three of their children in a boating accident all under the age of 16. And you find out these stories and, and you learn that, that somebody's grieving and they're struggling. And that opens a door to offer hope, to offer something better than what they currently have when we start talking about the gospel. And when you're sitting in a cemetery, 14 Bible studies in a month and a half. That blows my mind. I didn't even know that was, uh, never in a million years did I think that would happen. But those doors keep opening and we've got to ask ourselves, what will we do when the door opens? Well, when I've got too many Bible studies that I can't do them all on my own, guess what I've got to do? What the one talent man didn't do. I've got to bring someone else into my situation and say, I need your help. Can you go study with this person? Can you go study with that person? Can, can one of my elders take this family? Can one of my co-ministers take this family? Can one of our members who hasn't done anything in a while, will they go study with this person? What are we going to do with the opportunities that God gives us? We're running out of time. I told you to bring your pillows and stuff because it might take a while. Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. Wouldn't that be disappointing? Plant a fig tree and you don't get any figs? Watch as he keeps going. Then he said to the, to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? And I'd hate to be that fig tree. That not only would it be embarrassing and shameful, but it'd be terrifying that all he's saying is, why do you even waste my ground? Watch as he keeps going. But he answered and he said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. This guy that owns this tree is ready to just absolutely give up on it. He says, you know what? It ain't worth the time. It's wasting the ground. Cut it down. And somebody says, hang on. Now get, get this. If you don't get anything else tonight, please get this. Hang on a minute. Let me invest in it. And let's see what it does. Before you write it off, before you cast it out, before you're done with it, let me invest in it. You know, over quite a few years, I'm, I'm 31. I never thought I'd get to that point, but I am. I'm 31, and I have my whole life heard different generations talk garbage about each other. 
An older generation that says there's just no hope in this younger generation. A younger generation that says, well, the older generation's just stuck in their ways and they don't want to try anything any different. When will we live as someone taking care of this vineyard? And say, I get that things are not the way we want them right now. But give me a minute and let me invest in it. Think about that. He's saying, let me dig around it. Let me cultivate. Let me fertilize. Let me put something healthy around it and just see what it does. Just, just see what it does. Rather than talking about it, let me do something about it. Rather than just complaining about it, let, let me try. Let me make an effort. And so here in this moment, he, he's saying, you're ready to give up on something and tear it down. Many places that we've been, we, we were in um, Ohachi, Alabama. Just kind of, when you go down Interstate 65, you hit 20 in Birmingham, you go about an hour to the east, and you're pretty much there. Ohachi, Alabama. There was a family we met, and I'll, I'll let this be my last story because I don't want to keep you crazy late. Uh, and this family had left their house. The wife had called the husband. She said, there's a tornado on the ground. You need to get out of the house and go to the storm shelter. They lived in a single wide trailer. They were raising their grandson. And so he says, all right, I'll go right now. He waits a couple minutes, gets in his truck, and pulls out the driveway, turns off the road, looks in his rearview mirror, and watches his mobile home come apart. It's thrown up into the trees. It's scattered everywhere. All he, if you remember, this was last year. If you remember in, in the middle of Alabama, there was five people that died during a tornado. The first three people that died were in the house that was in front of his mobile home. They were in a brick home. It destroyed it and killed three of the people that were living there. It then ripped apart his mobile home. He was in his truck driving down the road watching it happen. Threw the mobile home up into the tree line, then hit the house behind him and killed two more. The five people that died were on the same street as this man. And so as, as we looked around and tried to figure out what are we going to do about this, he says, I'm, I'm just ready to give up. I just don't see the point. And so we talked for a little bit, and we ended up getting a phone call. And this is... This is going to take me a minute. This is good. So we get a phone call from a lady, and she says, uh, I, you guys do Project Unify. I've heard about what you do. I have a mobile home that's a double wide. I want to donate it to you. Would you take it? And so I said, absolutely we would. It's in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I called this family back, and I said, guys, don't give up. Don't give up. We're about to do something. Just hang in there for a minute. So we ended up finally getting the mobile home moved from Tuscaloosa. It was a two and a half hour run on the interstate for the mobile home. It gets there. The congregation I'm a part of stocks it all, packs it full of stuff. Refrigerators, the furniture that they needed, the heat and the air unit that they needed, the dishes, the vacuum cleaner, everything that they would need to survive. They stock it full. And that's, it's, it's fantastic. They didn't give up. But I didn't realize some other things that were going on that are even more incredible than that. So I, I get back on the phone. This is a matter of like five months. I get back on the phone with the lady that had donated the trailer, and I just wanted to thank her, and I wanted to say, you have no idea what a blessing you've been. She says, can I provide homeowner's insurance on that trailer for the next year? The people that lived there before didn't have any insurance. They had given up all of their insurance, emptied their savings to pay off their mobile home the day before he watched it get torn apart. So they, were, they didn't have anything. And so she takes care of all this, and I said, why are you doing this? And she was telling me about the tragedies that she'd been through over the past year and a half, that she had lost her husband, and it was a heartbreak for her. She had lost her son. Her son was the one who lived in that mobile home that she donated, and that all the stuff that was in it, the furniture-wise that was still in it, was his, and she had just bought it for him before he passed away, not knowing that he was sick with cancer that they didn't catch. And so as we talked for a little bit longer, she says, where do you worship? I said, I, said, I worship at the Ketter Church of Christ. Where are you? She said, I live in Hartzell, like 10 minutes down the road. It's not far at all. So she comes to meet with us, and she started asking a few questions. And through all of this tragedy, again, serving in disasters, this lady was just trying to, to find something that would fill an empty spot within her. And I asked her, I said, I'm just curious, do you know the gospel? And we started those questions. And the lady that was trying to help someone else to hold on was immersed into Christ six months after she donated a trailer to a family that thought they had lost everything. I want you to think about the fact that she was taking what she had, serving other people with it, and then she comes to know Christ because of the heart that she had to serve others. The doors that God opens are unstoppable when we choose to walk through them. 
The doors that God opens will take you places that you had no idea they could. They will lead people to Christ that you never in a million years would have dreamed. A lady willing to donate a mobile home after hearing everything that she had been through, I would have thought she was a member of the church already. I had no clue. And through all of that time and months of just talking, finally something clicked. Ask her what the gospel is. Why didn't I ask that day one? Why wasn't that our first conversation? A lot of times we assume things when we don't really know all of the answers. The last verse I want to share with you, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4. When you think about faith without works being dead, faith without works is dead. Let me be clear. Fathers, if you're not leading your homes and you're not actively using the faith that you have, then you don't have faith. You've got a warped illusion. Mothers and sisters and brothers and and fathers and grandfathers and aunts and uncles, if you are not using the faith that you have to be active, to do something for the Lord, then you don't have faith. Faith without works does not exist. It is dead. We've got to ask ourselves, what are we going to do? How are we going to serve someone else? The only way I can make sure I'm going to get to heaven is knowing God's word, and that will lead me to serving someone else every single time. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, watch what he says. This is the way that we ended our last devotional at Little Mountain Ministry Camp a couple weeks ago. He says, I charge you therefore, I'm giving you an instruction, I want you to do something. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. He says, I want you to do something, I want you to use your voice and I want you to teach people. He says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. At a moment's notice, no matter what point you are at in your life, I want you to be ready to tell people. He says, convince, rebuke, and exhort. He says, I want you to convince them because you've showed them the truth, because you know the truth. He says, once you've taught them, I want you to rebuke. If you need to set something straight, you help set it straight. But you don't leave it at a negative emotional note. You then exhort. You build them up and lift them up. With all long suffering, that means you don't quit easily. That means you don't give in just because the road gets difficult. Long suffering literally means to suffer long. This may take time. The next thing that he says, and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. There's going to come a point in your life where people just aren't going to listen, because they just want what they want because they want it, and they couldn't care less whether this is an authority or not. This is our only authority. Regardless of what the rest of the world does, This is where we get our instruction. Do you want to hear God's voice? If God could have a conversation with you every day, would you want that to happen? Because he can. If you'll just open your Bible and search the scriptures daily. The last thing he says here in verse 4, they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That's scary stuff. That's heartbreaking. Fathers, don't let that be your homes. Mothers, don't let that be your children. Brothers and sisters in Christ, don't let that be the person sitting next to you this morning, this evening. Don't let that be the person that you know that you love and you care about. Ask them what's the gospel. But let me even give you another opportunity. Maybe you thought the gospel was just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Maybe you thought the gospel was the good news and that's all that you know about it. If you need to be taught the gospel so you can teach others the gospel, let me know. I'm an hour down the road. I would love to come study with you, but I have no doubt there are men and women in this congregation that could do the same thing and want to do the same thing. But we've got to go to one another, not worried about what somebody thinks, not worried about shame or embarrassment, but serve one another through that teaching of the gospel. We're fixing to close with a prayer. I don't know if that's how we typically do, but that's what we're going to do. And I thank you for your time. And if you've got any questions about serving, if you've got any questions, just look at what Jesus does. You don't have to go to anyone but Jesus to learn how to serve. Take the talent God's given you and use it to his glory. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for today, and we thank you for the opportunity you give us to be together. God, thank you for this congregation and all the people that it's brought together that may not know each other any other way. God, we thank you for the body of Christ that brings so many people closer, that we can get to know one another, that we can encourage one another, lift one another up. 
that we can strengthen one another, that we can serve one another. And God, help us to get all of these temptations out of the way, whether it's emotional, physical, or, or just fear. God, help us to always look to you for answers and to lean on the body of your son that's in this place as well as all over the world. So in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.